All right, we got everybody getting here. We're, we're working through a few things uh, on our side with some technical difficulties. First of all, thank you for those of you who are here already. Uh, we had to do a little bit of a change with some stuff here on, on the channel, but uh, my name is Todd Cole. I'm the director of golf for the Sanford Power Golf Academy. And on behalf of uh, Sanford and on behalf of US Golf TV, uh, we're glad you're here and we're gonna talk some golf. Tonight we're talking specifically on putting. And so uh, hopefully if you got a chance to watch the video last, I don't know how many, we had, how many did we have last night, Sam? I think we had over 1,100 views. So uh, very positive just to see the people out and about and you know, finding something to do with, with golf. So we're, we're glad to provide that avenue. Yeah, so most of you already here, you already know Sam Bosser. Uh, uh, Sam, maybe just give yourself a quick introduction for those people who maybe weren't here last night or might not know you from before. Yeah, so uh, lead instructor here at the Sanford Power Golf Academy and uh, been working with, with the team here for about four and a half years and uh, love my job and obviously love the opportunity tonight to, to get into some putting and help you lower your scores, so. Yeah, so we're excited. We're going to dive in. So tonight we're talking about the three keys to great putting. And before we dive into that, uh, you know, first of all, we, we want to say, you know, thank you for being here. Hopefully you're staying safe with your family. Uh, hopefully you're, you're doing the things that the healthcare experts are suggesting that you do. And it's kind of a crazy time we're all living in right now with all the different things going on. But as we said a little bit last night, uh, we talked about, hey, golf will be here eventually, Coming. hopefully sooner rather than later and uh, we want to make sure you're ready to go and, and so on behalf of Sanford Power Golf Academy on behalf of US Golf TV we appreciate you being here and, and uh, be sure to leave some comments or questions in the comments section there because we're going to answer a lot of those things here tonight as we go through this whole process so uh, we're going to start first of all by just talking about some general concepts about putting I'm going to bring Josh in here Josh come on in Josh is one of our interns uh, from the University of Nebraska Josh uh, is a great new member to our team, and, and he's going to talk some specific things about uh, aiming tonight. But Josh, give, it, give everybody a quick introduction, kind of where you're from, and what you're going to be briefly talking about tonight. Yeah, so I'm Josh Baldus. Um, I'm from Fairmont, Minnesota. I went to school in Nebraska for the PGA Golf Management Program. I'm up here doing my internship. It's been a great, great experience for me. So uh, tonight I'm talking about aiming and how the putter, the way the putter looks, can affect how you aim it, actually. Pretty exciting. It's, it's pretty crazy stuff when you see it. If you haven't seen this before, Josh has got some really cool insights to help you in terms of, of how your putter, the putter that you choose, could greatly impact your aim, and then of course how that could impact uh, your stroke. And so, uh, but before we dive into this, we've got a lot of, lot of stuff to cover. Um, let's just, I want some opening comments about putting. Like, what are some things in general that you think are important? We're gonna talk about the three keys that we believe here tonight, but, but just overarching, uh, Sam, let's have you go first. What is just a general comment you'd make about putting for our audience? I think first off, putting often gets overlooked, and we talked about this in, the, in our previous videos with US Golf TV. Uh, you gotta love to putt, and Todd's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but just in general, thinking about as a kid, when you grow up, how much you're actually putting. I mean, those, those young guys are on the green, um, just, just getting mixing it up. I think sometimes we forget what this game is and what the joy of it is, and sometimes putting, can seem like it's a very simple skill, but you know we just got to get out there and practice a little bit more. So I'm curious what Josh thinks just in general about putting and what his philosophy is and his experience being a great putter. Yeah, so I think the main thing is to practice. I mean, most people really don't practice putting. And so when we go out and expect to putt well without practicing, it kind of makes it not fun, right? And so the more you practice, whether it's 20 minutes a day or once or twice a week, whatever your schedule allows, the more you'll improve at putting and you really start to enjoy it. So you gotta practice to get better. You gotta practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. There's a lot of truth to that. So you know, in, in terms of for myself, I think the narrative. Sam talked a little bit about that earlier. The narrative, like how, what do you actually tell yourself about putting? When you talk to people who are great putters, they love to putt. And if you think of anything that you truly love to do in life, whether it be playing golf or or you know, uh, in school or whatever that might be, working out. If you truly love to do something, you spend time doing it, and therefore you get better at it. And so the first thing I would say is just you got to be aware of your narrative. I don't know anybody who's a great putter who you know doesn't think of themselves as a great putter. And we talked a little bit about this last night in our conversation. In that um, you know the narrative is so important. And and if the only narrative you have that's is based on results, you're gonna have a lot of negative narrative, a lot of negative narrative because there's a lot of uh, difficulty in terms of golf and stuff like that. So Sam, give us just, a, let's talk about a little bit about some stats and we gotta dive into this because we got a, a ton of stuff to cover and we're gonna be here tomorrow, not, tomorrow also. 
at 2 p.m. Uh, we're talking about course strategy and some things like that. So we've got Justin on staff here too. He's going to be filtering our questions. So if you've got questions on the putting, be sure to fire those in there because we're going to answer those. But let's talk a little bit about expectations because I, I think a lot of people, they watch golf on TV, Sam, and they think they should just make every putt because that's what they see the guys and gals on TV doing. Great point, Todd. Yeah, so I think in general, if we're doing anything, we should have a certain expectation level, understand where we're at with our skill level, and match that out. First off, we're going to enjoy the game more, so we're not walking off the green or the, the golf course saying, what the heck, I, I putted terrible. Well, depending on your skill level, you might actually be falling within your, your, your average for that skill. So um, just to give a little perspective, from seven feet, so again, a seven-foot putt, which you know, if we, we'll show you later in uh, today's session, 56% is the conversion rate for that. So um, whether you think that's too high or too low, I just think it's an interesting number, Todd. I think a lot of people, I tend to, the first time I've heard that, I would have guessed more closer to maybe 70%. And so I think first off, just thinking about that, again, that's not just one putt over and over, that's over an entire round. And why sometimes that seems like, okay, well, I see all the pros making all these putts. Well, a lot of times the TV bias, as I call it, is, you're seeing all the best players. If they're playing well, they're usually rolling the rock pretty well, Todd, yeah. right? Right, Josh? So um, just in general, they're not gonna show the people missing those, those shorter putts. They're usually the people that are not making the cut. So sometimes there's a TV bias or a perception that the pros are making way more putts than 56%. Yeah. So that would be the first percentage. If we go back to about 10 feet, we go to 38%. So again, if we're thinking 10 feet away, I think, you know, I really, I was like, hey, if I make five or six, that's what I expect. 38%, you're making three and a half, you know, out of 10, that's pretty good for an amateur golfer, even a Very scratch good, yeah. golfer. So kind of take these things into consideration. If you go back to 15 feet, you're gonna get to 22%. And if you go to 20, you're gonna go down all the way to 14%. And by the time we get to that 20 feet percent, we really need to start thinking about speed control and two putting. Because that's about the time where we actually start kind of flipping a little bit. And then the focus has to completely change. So I think that will kind of tee up the conversation tonight, get you yeah. thinking about expectations, um, and maybe will really help you when you get off the golf course feeling good about where you're at with your putting. Yeah, and we're, this is, we're talking about tour professionals. We're talking about the best men and women players in the world who are playing on really good green conditions and really good, you know, they're practicing and playing every day. And so I think uh, that's important to understand because we talked about narrative, having good narrative, but part of narrative is based on proper expectations. And so just, just understanding some of those numbers, I think is really helpful. And then along, of course, what Josh said, at the end of the day, you got practice, you got to have a plan. So let's dive right into that. That's what we're talking about tonight. Yeah, the three keys which we believe to great party. And I'm going to dive into setup. So we're going to go ahead and move uh, places a little bit here and kind of move to a new spot. So first thing that we want to talk about in terms of getting set up is we've got to figure out where we want to position our feet, where we want to position the ball, these types of things. And one of the things that's very unique about putting is, is that, I mean, for the most part, you're on flat lines, right? I mean, when we're hitting irons and stuff like that, you got the ball above your feet, the ball below your feet. And it's, it's, the putting is really a dynamic in terms of, it's a, it's a skill in terms of you gotta be very precise. So getting set up correctly is probably the most important thing. And it's really something that's overlooked a lot. So here's how I go about doing this. Now this is uh, something that I, I use with my beginner golfers all the way to our tour professionals. So be sure to leave, if you got any questions on this or some things that maybe you are doing in your own setup that's helped you, put those in the comments and we'll be sure to get to those questions and answer them. So we use a lot of these just alignment rods. And I've already kind of pre-done this. So basically what we did here is, is I took my stance width, which was comfortable. So first of all, in terms of stance width, I'm pretty open to that. You know, some people like their stance a little bit closer, meaning their feet width. Some like them a little further apart. But at the end of the day, around shoulder width is pretty good. So what I did here is I just measured that out and I put a couple pieces of white tape around here. We'll show this to you in a little bit here to get a little bit closer view. All right, and then what I did is I just positioned where the ball would be. So here's how I did that. I just take it, I set it on the ground. So the first step is I just set up, I got my comfortable stance width, put my feet where I wanted them to be. I marked those two spots on the alignment rod so I know my stance width. Now to keep that consistent every time, I took some tape and just put it around there. Okay, pretty simple stuff. I know, Sam, you do something similar to some of your players. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, Todd, so that, that line, is that kind of going in generally the middle of your foot, or is it on the, the toe side or the heel or the pinky toe? 
Where's that line going? Good question. So I like to just set it up so that basically it's right in the middle of my feet. So right off the middle of both of my feet. That's kind of generally where I like that to be. Really good question. Now the next thing that I did is I measured that out. So you know, let's set a tape measure here and I measured out roughly the stance width. And like I said, this isn't going to be to perfection, but it's going to get you pretty darn close. So my stance width is right around, you know, 17 inches. That's pretty comfortable for me. And we want the ball to be just slightly forward of center. So then I just measured it out, took a yellow piece of tape, put it on there so it's just slightly forward of center. Now from this position, I have my stance width, I've got the ball slightly forward of center, and I've got a consistent thing that I can put down every single time. Now, here's the beauty of this. This is something that's really cool. If you take a look at your putter, what you'll notice is, is that the most putter grips are about the same length this way. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and measure it. And if you're at home, you can do this. Grab your putter, okay? Grab, if you've got a, a yardstick or something laying around, go ahead and measure it. Typically, they're gonna be around 10 to 11 inches. Mine is about 10, I don't know what your guys' are there. I'm gonna gather they're pretty close to the same. Yep, 10. 10 inches. Okay. We, we, we like the same putter grips. Yeah, <laughs> so measure yours. I'll be curious to see what it is. My guess is it's going to be somewhere between 10 and 11. Now, here's what I have found out after 20 years of teaching and testing this out. The distance that you should be from the ball is almost identical to the same width of your putter grip. Okay, so we can use that to our advantage. So I've taken my alignment rod. I've put it down. I've already one time with my coach checked my stance with my ball position. Now it's a pretty simple process. What I'm going to do, and I've got a couple coins here today, because we're not going to mark up our, our indoor turf here. I'm just going to take my line, I'm going to take the grip right here, I'm going to put it down, I'm going to take a coin, one of my pennies, and put it right there on the end of it like so. I'm going to take another penny, go back here, put it this way. Okay, now typically if we were outside and on the green, I would just take a Sharpie, and put a little dot right underneath where the ball should be, which is the yellow tape. Okay, but today, since we're inside, I'm gonna go ahead and just put a coin down there, move the rod away. Now, all of a sudden, I can put my feet in here, I can put the ball right here, and I know that every single time that I've got the ball and my stance width in the same position. So, Coach Sam, what do you think about that? What are some things that you might add to that, or how would you use that in your own coaching? Yeah, I think I'd also just add, I, I had a question earlier uh, from one of my friends who asked, you know, a lot of times you see people that are so focused on their setup full swing and they're very meticulous. And yet, you know, Ty's showing us something. I, I tend to think that people don't get enough detail on their setup. They just kind of set in there. And so to me, just in general, this process gives you a process. It gives you an opportunity to be very specific and having those exact things you need to work on. So to me as a coach, again, anything that helps me go through a process, Josh, Something that's going to help me set up consistent every time. That's half the battle. Absolutely. Half the battle is making sure before we even swing the club or the putter, we gotta, we're going to compensate if we don't have something right. So if you get your stance width, you get your ball position, um, you're going to be confident before you even hit that stroke. Yeah. So the first skill that we want to we want to do here, we want to tell you about is you got to get set up correct. I mean, putting is about precision. It's about accuracy. So getting set up is important on every shot in golf, but it's it's primo when it comes to putting. So real quickly again, here's how we do this. Very simple process, um, and then we're gonna move on to the next skill that Sam's gonna jump into here for you. So we got an alignment rod. We measured our comfortable stance width, all right? Whatever that is for you. Then we went to the middle of it, and we moved just slightly targets, or excuse me, a cup side, so that, the, so that the yellow piece of tape is just slightly in front of it, so it's just slightly forward of center. We go ahead and put it down, point it on a target, one of the things that we learned here today is that typically your distance from the ball for most golfers is going to be about the same length as your putter grip. We just went ahead and measured it out, put a couple tees on the ground or a couple uh, coins in this particular instance, and then we've got a consistent spot for setup. So any, hopefully that kind of makes sense. If you've got any questions on that or some different things, we can go ahead and answer some of those. And then I got one quick drill and then we got to move on to the next thing here. So let me show you a quick drill and then we'll answer a couple questions while Sam gets set up. So, once you're in a setup position, my favorite drill to work on the setup basically is staying nice and steady. So, uh, you want to grab, let's grab a couple balls out of there, guys. Let's grab a couple balls, Josh. We'll get that. So, here's my favorite drill. Josh, why don't you go ahead and get set in there? I want to have you demonstrate this. So, what we're going to have you do is basically just hit some pots. You can kind of punt them towards the camera. 
and you're going to put them off just your lead foot only. Okay, so you're going to balance on your left foot only. There you go. And you're just going to hit some putts balancing on that lead foot. Now, when you're doing this, what are you feeling there? Oh, I was a little shaky that time. I'm going to work on my balance a little bit. But, this, is right. a, this is a great way for you to have a sense of where you feel like your balance is going to fall forward or backward, something like that. So after we get set up, this is the first drill that I do. It kind of leads into the setup. You go ahead and roll another one there for let them kind of see how it works. It's a little bit more challenging than it looks, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So those are that's one drill that you're, we're going to do and some stuff on setup. So let's go ahead. we got a couple of questions coming in here. And while we're doing that, Sam can get set up for the next thing we want to talk about. So Josh, let's talk about this. I see, uh, we've got a question here. I see some players with the ball position off the, off the player's front foot. Is that too far forward? Okay, really good question. So what are some of your thoughts on ball position? Um, I think ball position affects how the putter works into the ball, like the attacking goal off the putter yeah. when it strikes the golf ball. And so if it gets too far forward, it might be hitting a little too far up on the ball, adding loft to the putter, and then you'll have some speed distance, speed control problems, is yeah. what I would think. I think most of the research that we've done and what, we, what we've learned is, is that the ball, we want to catch the ball as the putter is traveling ever so slightly in an upward motion. So all things being equal, that would be slightly on the forward side of the, of the arc, all right? And so that's why we like the ball to be just ever so slightly forward of center. Now. Are there golfers who have it more forward? Of course there are, or maybe some back, but I think as a general rule, you want that ball to be just ever so slightly forward or center. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. All right, so um, let's got one more question. We're gonna get Sam, we're gonna go through some stuff over here. So we've got one more. How important are custom fitted putters? Um, well, I think it's pretty important. And I think we're gonna be talking about that pretty soon when you go to your stuff. What do you, I, know, I know Josh's opinion on this. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important. Um, we've seen it a lot with our students lately yeah. that, I mean, just grabbing a putter off the shelf and hitting around with it and then you would be like, you might make a few putts and buy it and then all of a sudden you find out you can't aim with it. And so really going through a fitting process to find the right putter for you can really help help your putting. I would agree with that. Big time. I mean, you, you get fit for drivers, you get fit for wedges. Putter is the one club you use the most often. I think you should be fit, but we'll talk more about that later. All right, so let's keep moving on here. We got Sam's gonna talk about some different stuff. Sam, go ahead and take the lead. Thanks, Todd. So, like we talked about, the three great skills that you need to have to be a good putter here. So Todd talked about the setup. So first and foremost, before you even strike the golf ball, you got to make sure that you have that great setup. The second thing, and you've maybe even heard of this. Again, all three of these are very, very important. But I'm gonna talk to you about speed control. Okay, so think about speed control, not only in the form of longer putts, which a lot of times we call leg putts, but I also want you to think about speed control on makeable putts. So makeable putts to me is anything between seven to 15 feet, some of those putts that we're trying to make for par, maybe for birdie. So when we think about speed control, again, at the end of the day, we can aim perfectly, and if, if we don't have the right speed, we're never gonna have the opportunity to make that putt. So there's, just again, some expectations that we need to understand when we putt. So for one thing, we need to understand again, just the general width of a golf hole. The, golf, the width of a golf hole is 4.25 inches. So I want you to think about that, and I'm actually gonna have Josh, if you could roll out a ball here to one foot on this hole, we need four golf balls. So as we get that set up, think of just the, the width of a golf hole here, okay? So we're gonna get set up as we have one feet. We're gonna have another one at three feet. One at five feet and one at eight feet. Thanks, Josh. So the width of that hole, 4.25 inches. So think about a ball that's entering that hole. It's a consistent speed. If we get that ball to enter the hole and it's coming in and just dying over the lip, a lot of times that is gonna actually allow the hole to be the width, 4.25, makes sense, right? So if it's just dying, it has that opportunity, the full width of the hole to make it. So if you look at this first ball, so one foot pass, so if we think we're putting from this direction going this way, okay, you go one foot past the hole, the hole actually shrinks to 2.6 inches. Okay. okay, so it's shrinking by over 38%. That ball, all of a sudden, even with one foot pass, that, that ball is, that hole is shrinking. So you just need to understand, one foot is a really good speed control putt, if you think about it, especially a longer putt. Okay, if you're thinking about a makeable putt, still a very good speed control. If we go all the way to three feet past the hole, again, not very far past the hole, that's shrinking the hole to 1.4 inches. So again, 
just by being three feet past, 1.4 inches. Start to think about that. That is really shrunk down. If we go to five feet, that's shrinking down to 0.5 inches width of the hole. And if we go eight feet past the hole, which is this last ball, that basically the hole no longer exists. So just to think about that and have the visual, I think one thing first is just understanding that for a leg putt, if you're putting at five feet past, a lot of times that's a really good speed control putt, right? Yeah. Okay, so a lot, if we're making putts, longer putts than 20 feet and we're making them, we're probably getting pretty lucky if we're making them. So one thing that we talk about a lot with speed control is not just focus on leg putts, but focus on your speed control on makeable putts. Uh, the two things that really determine whether you're gonna have a good stroke is two things, length of motion. So we're talking about the length of the motion back and through, and then what we call as cadence. So cadence or tempo, uh, those are kind of things, the, the rhythm that goes within that stroke, those are the real two factors that determine how far, you know, how short, how fast, how slow that golf ball is going. So when you have this general understanding, you're gonna have a better, you know, better way to practice and understand those expectations and really work on your speed control. Outside of that, the misconceptions with speed is that at the end of the day, you know, you're gonna be a, you're gonna be off here a little bit, but once you get outside 20 feet, you're gonna really have to work on the two putts. You're not trying to convert a one putt at that point, and that's really even the pros are doing that, Todd. Yeah. So when you're talking about, so a couple, couple things are coming to mind there as you're talking about that. So because a lot of you feel like, hey, I, I'm an aggressive putter, like yeah. a lot, like especially a lot of young people, they're like, I want to be an aggressive putter. So I mean, what does, how does that impact? I mean in terms of the size of the cut? I mean, what would you tell somebody like that? Yeah, great question. First off, we're talking about potentially, you know, if there's like a four footer and you know for sure it's gonna, it's a straight putt. Yeah. You see the pros, they put it in the back of the cup, but they have a for certain that they're gonna make that. Yeah. But if we're talking about a breaking putt or a longer putt, the best putters are dying it in the hole. So there, there's a lot of misconception or maybe people say, I putt better when I bang it in the back of the hole, mm -hmm. or I play through the break. I think that could be true on certain putts, but in general, most good golfers are learning how to die the ball in the hole. And again, using that hole as a visual and understanding that the whole width is gonna be available if you're dying it over the net. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you said there that, that really rang home to me was is that we think a lot about, in terms of uh, speed control, with longer putts. Yes. And, and even when we coach it, that's typically how we teach it, like ladders, long putts, right? Those types of things. But speed is, even more important on those makeable putts, because as Sam was just talking about it, it in essence reduces the size of the cup if, if your speed is not very good. I remember when I was, uh, this was a couple years ago when we were with one of the teams traveling and some of our kids were playing in, in one of the tournaments and there was a few college coaches out recruiting and uh, the college coach said, I always make my guys, he was, he was coach of the men's team, uh, I always make my guys track how many times they have to mark their ball after their first putt. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. I'm like, what, why, what's the reason? He says, well, because if they roll it by two, three, four feet, they have to mark it, yeah. right? Then their speed's not very good. So if you're like, is my speed good or not? That would be a question that I would think somebody would want to know. My question to you would be is how often do you have to mark your ball after you hit your first putt? Very true. And if you're marking a lot, your speed's not very good, right? And also, I think not only in terms of what Sam's talking about, but the size of the cup, which is hugely important, but also it's just the fact that Every time you got to mark and then you got to putt again, man, it's adding stress to your day and stress to your round. And by the time you get to the 14th, 15th hole and you're exhausted because you've been marking all day long, I think that's that can really wear on you. So not only is it the size of the cup, but just in terms of, of uh, the ability to kind of keep a stress-free round going. Great point. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, speed control is going to be very crucial. Just as what we're going to talk about here with Josh, you bring these two things together with setup. It's really going to provide those opportunities to make those putts, but I do think the expectation level is important, even from a professional standpoint. Yeah. You know, making those putts, they don't really make that many putts outside of 15 feet. Yeah, I you think, know, yeah. so I think it's really important. You're going to average out. You know, you're going to over four rounds. You're going to maybe make, you know, two outside of 15 feet, but you may only make one first round, and round three you make five. Yeah. So it's more about having confidence walking off the green that hey. I'm, I'm right within my wheelhouse as far as my skill level and what I'm expecting to make. You yeah. still want to make everything, you just have realistic expectations. Yeah, it goes back to your comments earlier about the expectations. And so, um, all right, so that's a little bit about speed control, about the size of the cup. I think that Sam's gives a great visual 
you know, if you're marking the ball, it's a foot by, it's this, the, the size of the cup is this way and so on. So let's talk about a drill that they could do to practice that. And then I know Josh is going to start getting set up here for some other things too. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the drill. What are we going to have them kind of work on and do there? So the drill that we're going to work on, you're going to set up, you can do this with four golf balls, four tees, four markers. So we have, we have some chips out here. So we're going to actually put these out. I'm going to grab them here real quick. So you're going to pick a starting point. You're going to pick just a tee. You're going to put a tee down. You're basically going to walk off. You're going to go to five feet. You're going to put one at 10 feet and you're going to put one at 15 feet. Okay. Whatever distance you want to work on. Okay. And this is going to kind of start the ladder drill that you're going to do. Okay. So let's say we're starting down here. So if we start from right here, the key with this is we want to make sure that our length of motion and our cadence is matching how far the how far our target is away. So right now we have a five and a 10 foot chip and I'm just gonna start out, the key here is two things. I'm gonna make sure that in my routine, I'm very much using my eyes, okay? So the tendency for a lot of golfers is they tend to be too stagnant or static looking down at the golf ball. So think of the best athletes in the world. Think of Jordan Spieth, okay? You're thinking of Steph Curry, Tom Brady. Golf is different because you're over the ball Basketball, you're looking at the hoop when you're shooting a free throw. Okay, Tom Brady, when the ball's going over the middle, he's zipping it, he's looking at the target. So the challenge for us as golfers is when we're looking over this golf ball, we're not looking at our target, and that's why it's a little bit more challenging. So, so you're saying when they make their practice motions, they should be looking at the target? Is that what we're yes, saying? Yes, exactly. So and at, at some point, you're, you're obviously going to get set up and make sure, just like we worked with Todd, you have good ball position, your feet are set. Once you feel comfortable in your practice strokes, I want you to look at your target while you're making your strokes. Okay? This is really important because your eyes are going to tell you, you're, you're, it's basically telling you how far, how big, how slow, how fast to make your strokes. So if you do that, you're going to be a little bit more athletic as opposed to static over the golf ball. So if you do this, start out with your pre-shot routine. You're just going to feel out what this first chip is, which is five feet. So in your head, you're looking at the chip and you're making continuous strokes. You're not just stopping, I would call these continuous strokes where the, the putter continues to move. If we do this and set over the ball at five feet, now we're more athletic and looking at that target when we're putting here, okay? So same thing if I grab another ball, there's various ways you can do this drill. But again, if you do this, now go to the 10 foot one. And again, I'm, you can see I'm using my eyes to look at my target or the hole. That's allowing to be more athletic once I get over the ball. I'm going to be one more quick glance down at the ball over at the hole, and I'm going to let it roll. The key is we're not hitting the ball, we're rolling it. Want to be an athlete. Want to be an athlete, okay? So it's a philosophy. If we hit the ball, that's a totally different feel than roll the ball. Yeah. Okay, we're going to roll through it. So you can do this, and again, just you'll find yourself being way more athletic. It may feel weird to look at the, the target more, but I do think you're going to roll more putts closer to the hole, probably make it through. I love that. I love that drill. Okay, so let's let's do this. Let's kind of circle back over here. Nick, let's bring the camera in a little bit closer. We're going to answer a few questions. Josh is going to start getting set up a little bit. This is the, come on over, Sam. We're going to answer some questions here. This is the beauty of doing live video. Yeah. Because we get to move around and, and you get to see behind the scenes stuff of how it all works together. So hopefully we've, we've answered a few things for you. It's a little bit on setup, a couple drills you can do, engaging in the hole. Sam brought some great information about expectations, a little bit about, you know, the size of the cup and thinking about your speed control in terms of not just on longer putts but makeable putts. Do you got to mark your ball after you putt? If you're marking it, you're probably not very good with your speed. Some basic things like that that can be really helpful. All right, so let's answer. We got some, keep firing these questions out there because we've got a lot of stuff that we want to answer for you while you're here. So, how would, Sam, let's jump into this one. I'm going to have okay. you start. How would you relate putting practice to actually putting on the course? So, putting practice on the putting green. How does that actually relate to on the golf course? Yeah, I think it's all about how you set up that practice. You know, so at the end of the day, that is where there is, you know, kind of a gap or maybe a block as far as your performance compared to your practice. So even like a drill that you're doing, a common one that I see with people, let's say they're just trying to make seven footers, Todd. They, they got seven tees up around the green or around the hole and they're putting. A lot of times they're just trying to make it. Well, if it's specific to speed, a lot of times they're putting, if they don't make it, they don't worry about where it goes. Well, in a real round, if you miss a seven footer and it goes eight feet by, 
you have to make that putt coming back or you three putt. So I think practice how you play. And that's a big thing, connecting the, the skills there. And so a lot of times I feel there's a disconnect with how you practice. You do have to work on speed control even on your short putts. You can't just hammer the ball and if you miss, you know, then all of a sudden you're on the golf course. You're, you're putting and you made three putt and all of a sudden we know there, there's kind of a snowball effect with that. Yeah, I would add to that very similar to what we talked a little bit about last night. If you were able to tune in last night, um, trying to set up your practice so it replicates more like golf, just what, what Sam was saying. So typically with my students, if they're going to practice their putting, let's say for 45 minutes, we might do eight to 10 minutes of technical work, build out the template for the setup, do some specific drills that relate to their technique. And then we're, we're, we're putting like we're playing games, we're doing makeable putts, we're, we're moving around, we're trying different things. So hopefully that helps answer a little bit. Try to be more uh, game-like in your practice versus just putting. I don't know why it is with putting, but sometimes putting, I'll go to the putting green, they're just people saying they're these training aids for hours on end just hitting the same thing over and over. That's not really golf, that's not really what putting is about. All right, a couple more questions as Josh is finishing getting set up there. So what's a tip you have for uh, makeable putts from seven to 15 feet? I'll dive into this first and we'll get Sam's input. So I would say this, number one is visualizing it. Yes. Okay, I think I, I'm a big believer in, in trying to visualize where the putt's gonna roll, where it's gonna enter the cup. So one of the questions I always, ask myself and I have my students ask themselves is when the ball is going to enter the cup, where is it going to actually enter the cup? So what most people do, most of us got some break to them, a little bit of break to them. So what most people do, and we've actually done some videos on this on US Golf TV, which you can check them out, but most people draw a straight line from the ball to the center of the cup. And the truth is that the ball is not rolling on a straight line. It's, it's arcing or curving in some form or fashion. So I always ask them, where is the true center of the cup? Meaning, where is that ball gonna actually enter the cup from what angle? And if your eye starts going to that spot where it's gonna enter, all of a sudden the cup starts to change and everything starts to look a little bit different. So my tip to, to making more of those seven to 15 footers is to visualize the putt going in, but more importantly, visualize what side of the cup is it gonna be entering based on the break. And hopefully that will help you. What do you got for a tip on that? Thank you. To go off what, what Todd said, that's a great information right there, just visualization. So I think the process in your pre-shot routine, the tendency is to be way too, you know, am I aimed right? Okay, am I yeah. aimed right? And if you miss, you're so focused on, well, I wasn't aimed right. A lot of times it comes down to speed. It comes down to it speed. Does. And so I do think a pre-shot routine, I think you should go through this acronym. It's called SAS. Okay, so when you're stepping into the ball and you're making your strokes, the first S is for speed. So focus on speed in your, your rehearsal swings. As you step up into the ball, okay, you're gonna make sure that your aim is good, then you're gonna trust it. You're gonna know that you aimed well. And the last thought, will you look at the hole and come back, you have a mental image, you're back to speed. So it's the SAS, speed, aim, speed. When you do that, your last thought is speed along with aiming well. I think you're gonna make more putts that way. I've seen it work really well. I like that, I like that a lot. I like the, the, uh, the just the letters, boom, boom, boom. It's easy to remember and something that we can apply. All right, so we're gonna dive into some stuff here now uh, with Josh. Keep those questions coming, keep putting them in the comments. We're saving some time at the end to answer all these questions. So keep them coming in. We've got a lot of other information we can talk about. So we're gonna move over here now. Like I said, this is the beauty of live TV, Josh. Here we go, we're gonna talk about aim. So what do you, what do you got for our audience here on aim? Okay, so first we're gonna talk about how the shape of your putter and where the lines are like located on the putter can change the way you aim the putter itself. So there's blades, there's mallets, there's all sorts of different shapes, right? And so the idea is that a mallet, like the one I have here, has a curved back. And so what that does is it shifts our focus to the front of the putter, which changes our aim, okay? And if I grab a blade here, I have one right here. The blade has a straight line in the back, which then focus our aim to the back of the putter. And this one actually has a line in the back too, which also shifts it even more further back. So all those variables can change the way we actually aim the putter. So just, and, the, just the, literally the shape of the head, yeah. it's kind of what you're saying, and where the lines are, because most, most people, um, you know, most people, if you're like me, you go to, you go to the local golf store or the golf course yeah. and you just grab a putter, and you get a couple of putts, you're like, ah, oh, it feels good. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do something here. The, both putters have a mirror on them, and then we have a laser on the ground. And so what it's going to do is it's going to reflect off the mirror, and it's going to show me 
where I'm actually aiming when I'm trying to aim at the, the, the hole that we have down on the ground. Okay, you can do that or do you want one of us to do that? I'll do it. I've seen you aim. Your aim is pretty good. All right, right? Maybe you should do one of us. Come on, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll try this. All right, what are we going to go with first? Doesn't matter. All right, I'm going to try this one first. Okay. I'll give you that hold on. All right, so show me. What are we doing here? So we got a thermal laser on. And then you're going to go through your entire process. Okay. Like line this back way up here. So you're going to go through your entire aiming process, and all you're trying to do is make that ball into that into the circle. Right, now I hope my aim is good, but this could this could decrease my lesson revenue. Hopefully you guys <laughs> <laughs> nobody's going to believe me anymore if I my aim isn't good. Josh, you're putting us on putting us on the spot here. All right, let me go ahead and get set. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to aim at the center of the laser. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right, I think that's pretty good, my friend. Okay. Move the ball. Ooh, not too bad. Not bad. It's a little bow and a little right, right? Okay, so, all right, let's talk about that. Sam's my coach. Sam, student comes in and they're aimed. I was a little lower, a little to the right. As a coach, what is that, what is that gonna, what's gonna happen? What does that mean for me as a player if somebody's not aimed right? So two things there that Todd mentioned. Obviously, aim left or right, but also loft of your putter. So loft of your putter is just as important, but if someone's aiming right, usually, you know, if someone continues to miss right, they're going to find some way. People are better athletes than you think. They're going to find a certain way to compensate that. So if someone has, you know, no loft on their putter and they're, they have the, his aim was to the right, he's going to compensate it probably with his path or maybe some way in his setup. So a lot of times people have certain setups or paths because they just aren't aiming well. Aiming usually is king, and it's going to dictate a lot of other things. Not all the time, but if you're not aimed well, that would be one thing, is you're probably going to change how you're coming through. You maybe add a little loft, and maybe he's going to you know, turn it over with his hand. There's a lot of different matchups that someone's going to do, because at the end of the day, you're not going to keep missing right. You're going to find a way to get that club through. But again, a matchup doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be any better. You're just trying to figure out how to get it closer to the hole. And I, and I would agree with that. I don't know, Josh, what you think there, but I would say this, that we put a ton of focus, even as coaches and as players, on making sure that our feet and our shoulders and our arms or whatever are all aimed, right? Square or whatever word you want to call it. And what I have actually found, I mean, is that, I mean, some of the best putters I've been around, their feet and their, I mean, they're not perfectly square to the target line. Some of them are a little bit open, some are a little closed, but I will say this, I would probably bet my, you know, dollars to donuts that their putter face is probably pretty good. Yeah. I mean, even though their stance might be a little bit open, their putter face is probably pretty good. So I, to, to kind of dovetail off what Sam just said there, I think being generally square is probably best for most people, but what's most important is the putter. So, all right, we've got another one for me to try out. Perfect. Yep, yeah, so we switched right. to the blade there. Let's okay. see that same process. This one actually looks a little better in my eye, but I'm going to be curious to see how yeah. I can even. All right, what do we got? That feels good there. All right, so now we're, we're square to the target, but it's shifted pretty high, right? So whether that's the setup, and we just need to get more over the ball with our end, we need a little shaft lean. Yeah. Or we can change the putter, and so it changes the way you perceive it, and it'll bring that loft down. What's really interesting about just doing, I mean, you know, that was just a quick thing there, but I did my best to try to aim both of them, and I didn't really think much about the shape of the putter other than just trying to visually aim it. Yep. Correctly. So, so what you're saying here is that in essence, the shape of the putter and where the lines are, as we just saw, can drastically change how we aim. Yep. Definitely. What are some other variables outside of just the? Because I know there there could be a couple, right? I mean, outside of the head shape, outside of the lines, what are a few other things? Yeah. So lie angle affects it, right? Anything with loft on the face and the toes, whether the toes up or toe down, changes the way we aim a little bit. There's the hosels, so you can have a forward offset, a back offset hosel, or just right on square like that. That'll change the way it aims. The length of the putter changes how you aim it. So there's a lot of variables to think about. Yeah. So, so. so the next time you're, you know, thinking about getting a putter, you know, a lot of times it does happen. I've done the same thing. You know, I, I was a loyal, you know, Scotty Cameron, which is a great putter, but. A lot of times you fall in love with the, the look, and that's important, yeah. and the feel, but consider at the end of the day, if you're going to make more putts, right, Todd? I mean, feel comfortable with your aim. Make sure that your aim is well. Go see a professional. Go get fit, and then that's really going to give you confidence. When you have confidence, you're set over the ball well. I think that's half of putting, because at the end of the day, if you're, if you're off on your putt and you realize that, 
you start to realize, oh my, I'd have to make some big compensations to make that pop. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, people are gonna, your stroke is gonna kind of have to be an adjustment based on your aim. I mean, it's like in the full golf swing, right? Yeah. I mean, we see it all the time happen. I mean, if somebody starts slicing the golf ball and they're right-handed, where do they start to aim? They start aiming left, because the ball's slicing to the right. I mean, and so uh, getting your putter aimed correctly initially, or at least to the best of your ability, is gonna give you the best chance to make a quality stroke. So we got a couple questions here I wanna, I wanna go through with Justin. Keep finding those questions out there, or if there's anything else you want us to make sure we talk about as it relates to putting, we've got a little bit of time yet where we go through those. So one of the questions is, what about putter fitting or putters for youth? Because we work with a lot with youth. Somebody wants to know about that. Like, because I see it all the time. I mean, kids come in and they, they usually have dad's putter or mom's yeah. putter, right? What do you guys think about that? What would we advise our audience out there for our parents and their kids that are playing golf? Yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, golf clubs are expensive. So I think sometimes you have to go with what you have. Um, a lot of times we see putters that are too short because kids start to grow. Yeah. Um, it, it will it will potentially change their stroke. So I do think it's important to find that putter. A lot of times people spend four hundred five hundred dollars on a new on a new driver, but that putter you're probably going to hopefully have if you're making putts for you know your entire life. I know some putters on the tour. Tiger he was using the same putter for his whole career. Yeah. So um, I think it would be important to go get fit by a professional. I think the length of the putter is going to determine a lot of what you know you're going to do and that's a compensation if it's short you know you're going to be standing a certain distance or closer to it which is going to impact your path and your aim and all those factors and variables. What do you think Josh? What, what would you? Yeah I think the main time when I see this is like especially with our young like our tater tots I mean one putter is about as tall as the girl and <laughs> so it's like it's almost it's pretty much impossible for us to really teach her proper setup because I mean the putter is huge and so having the right length putter for the younger kids is, is really good so okay okay a couple more questions let's keep those questions coming in because we want to well like I said we'll answer anything we got here we got a couple of things we want to go through but how do we know what how do we know what shape of putter I think head design of putter how do we know what's best for them so like, I mean is there any advice we can just generally give people when they go in and look what should they be looking at I think the first thing I would look at is if you have a general miss, whether like say you have a blade right now and you miss consistently, whether it's on the right or left, okay? And if you can kind of adjust, like so the blade will aim you to the right and you'll miss more putts to the right. So if you go to a mallet, you can kind of see maybe those putts start, mm -hmm. maybe you start missing left and then you're gonna mess with where the lines are on the putter. But I think the first step is to figure out where you're missing with your, the putter you have right now. Yeah. What do you think, Sam? What, any advice on just general head designs? You know, because I know right now the bigger heads and kind of the almost like, they're almost like training wheels. I mean, like these types of things, you know, I think it's pretty popular right now. Yeah, I think big thing is like speed control too. I mean, sometimes something looks good and feels good, but the thing that gets overlooked too is your speed control. If you have a putter, Again, the big thing like Todd said right now is like a spider putter is great. A lot of putters have a lot of weight in the head right now. Um, a lot of experts are saying there's too much weight in the head. Sometimes people think that feels better to have more control. But what happens, and again, this is what some people are saying, is that you, have too, you don't know how to use that energy or that mass at the bottom of your stroke. And so that's a lot of times what happens. All of a sudden you add a little bit with a wrist or something like that. Even though you think your hands are staying steady, you know, at the end of the day, the, the actual weight of the club is changing. So if you get a putter in your hand, pay attention to the head, not only for how it feels and the aim, but also speed control. And I know we had a question come in here, one that was a really good question. A lot of times, Todd, people are aiming, they, they line up the ball yeah. with, you know, like a pro, a pro V golf ball, a tennis golf ball, they have a oh, line yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, what would be your advice with that? Is that something that people need to do? Does it help you putt better? What, what's your expertise in that area? Yeah, that's the, uh, well, here's my thought on that, is is that what you're saying is like something they got the words on it or people line up. I even see people you know put a circle on it, you know, all kinds of different things. I mean, I, I, I don't mind that for training, because I think maybe to train your eye to get aimed properly and things like that. I, I think for most people, uh, that they, they want to be more like more reactive. It goes back to some of the visualization that we were talking about. 
you know, I think you want to visualize where that ball is going. Sometimes the more stuff you get down there, the more focus you get. Oh, I'm two degrees aimed to the right, or I'm two left. And I think that's great when you're when you're training. But when you're out there playing golf, I mean, I think you got to see it, you got to visualize it. And so I've kind of actually done a little bit of a flip on this. I used to always really line mine up. Now I'm just, I put it down there so I can just, it, there's really no lines that I can see. And I just try to react to it and see that. It that seems to work pretty well for me. I don't know, what, have you guys seen anything with your students? Uh, I think the big thing is to stay consistent. True. Um, I don't know. Sometimes you're like, oh, I won't mark it down. You're just playing casually, and all of a sudden you start making a lot of putts. And then you're going to be like, well, now I'm not going to use the line anymore in your round. And then you're going to start, and you'll miss putts. Everybody misses putts. And you're going to be like, oh, shoot, now I go back to using the line. And kind of pick whatever works best for them and then stick to it, I think. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, if you're not a linear person, you don't see lines. Yeah. Right, putting a line on your ball might not be what's best because then you're focused on that and you're not focused on your target and the visual. So I think it's important, you know, maybe think about why you do things. That's kind of the big question I have is like, what are you actually doing? Being more aware and asking the why. Do you just do it because everybody else is doing it? Um, or is it actually helping you make more putts and, and have confidence? So. Yeah. One of the things I know that when it comes to putter fitting too, then we're going to move on to a couple other questions related to the stroke. Uh, the putting stroke. So keep those questions coming in. We're going to happy to answer as many as we can here tonight. But is the style of grip on the putter? I want to talk a little bit about that because uh, we've seen a really big insurgence over the last four or five years of big, thick grips, and that's really popular right now. And I know there's a couple different, you know, thoughts on that because we were talking about feeling the putter. You were talking about the weight of the putter. Um, one of the things that I've been finding as of late, I'm seeing actually a little bit more of a trend, especially with better players to start to move away from that a little bit. This whole concept of the big, thick grip and locking the hands in, I mean, I think is in theory good, but it goes a little bit back to what you were talking about with trying to line that ball up perfectly. And I think we're trying, I find it interesting that we're trying to like dial everything down to this like, you know, these little things, but yet we forget at the end of the day, we gotta see it, we gotta roll, we gotta have good speed and all types of stuff. So I've actually, I've been encouraging some of my students to get back to a little bit of the thinner grip, kind of like the pistol type grip, the old one that, that was on a ping putter that I used yeah. for years. I used to use it on my Scotty Cameron right now. I mean, I can feel it. It's a little bit more on my fingers. I can feel the weight, and I've noticed that my speed is good and my lines are good. I don't know. What do you guys think about the actual type of grip on the putter? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, again, I think people try to find, like, hey, what, what's going to make me most still and stable, which is a very important putting. But a lot of times people are even just talking about their body, like what's actually moving. A lot of good putters actually do have a little bit of action. Yeah. I'm not saying that they're wristy, but some of the best putters, and maybe the greens were slower back then, I know they were, but if you watch Jack Nicklaus, if you watch Arnold Palmer, they, you know, they get down and they had a little bit more wrist they action. Do, yeah. So there's all sorts of good putters out there. I think Brent Snedeker is one of them. He has a really short kind of poppy stroke. Yeah. You have some that are more conventional, but at the end of the day, also, you have to consider, this is crazy, but the, the actual type of grip you have might might change your aim. We found that out. So if you have, you know, the flats so out, it's, it's one of the, the popular grips right now. What they found is that that actually changes your aim a little bit. It can actually open your putter up based off of how you're holding it in your hands. So we haven't talked much about the grip, um, but those are things that also matter in, yeah. in, in your setup and, and, and what's going on with the strokes. So. Well, all right, so let's keep kind of moving forward here because I want to get into some stuff related to the stroke. So, I mean, that's a lot of information I know about putter and putter feet. I hope what you took away from Josh's really good demonstration there is, is that when you get a putter, just be thinking about it. You know, be thinking about the shape of it, be thinking about the lines of it, be thinking about the type of grip that's on it. Because much like when you buy a driver or your irons, those things can impact how you roll the ball, how you aim, and that type of stuff. So that's the real whole purpose behind that. Just get you thinking. We're not going to give be able to provide every answer in every scenario right now, but just get you thinking a little bit. So, all right, a couple other questions that have come in. One of them wanted to know about tempo and rhythm. You were talking about cadence yes. earlier. How do like, how does somebody work on rhythm and cadence? That's a great question, Todd. So first, I think it's very unique to what your stroke is, but I'm a big believer the length of your stroke is going to dictate what your cadence is. Okay. So, um, I Can you think, kind of demonstrate a little bit? Yeah. Grab them. Show, us, show us what you mean by that. So, so first we talked about the variable. So we talked about the length of your stroke. So back and through. So I could have a really long, lazy stroke. I could also have a short one. Okay. What would be examples of that? To kind of give us some visuals. You mentioned 
Yes. Brent Snedeker, okay. Brent Snedeker would be a very short and kind of poppy, okay? And then you also have, I think Tiger Woods has a very long kind of stroke. So he How about has like Ben Crenshaw? Ben, ben old guys. Very, very, very good example <laughs> there. Ben Crenshaw, so very long. So depending on that, that there's not a perfect system, but you have to match that up. At some point as a good athlete, you're going to figure out what your cadence is within that to get it to the hole. So if you're right here and you have a short stroke and you just go like this, how far is the ball going? Depending on what your target is. So, you know, Snedeker has to have that, that quick cadence to get the ball to the hole. So I, I'm a big believer first in understanding most of the general thing for most golfers, if you get this putter working back and forth between your feet, usually most people don't do that well. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I see people with inefficient strokes. So if you can get your length of motion more consistent, okay, then within that, everybody knows what a metronome is. So a metronome, a lot you can get anything on your iPhone these days, so it's an app. Just if you've ever been in music class, okay, I was first trumpet, first chair. So oh, really? I don't know if you guys knew oh, that. Oh, I didn't yeah. even know that. That's something we so, learned about uh, Sandler. Uh, uh, <laughs> so met <laughs> metronome, okay, so metronome with that. So you do beats per minute, essentially. So the average tour um, beats per minute is between 72 to 90. So again, Brent Seneker, he's probably faster than the 90. He might be 100, but he's going like this, where Crenshaw is more like 70, like this. You need to set that up and it's just going to kind of tick back and forth kind of like this and a general cadence and a tempo and that's going to actually be something that you can set down work on different lengths of putts but also consistently have that internal kind of cadence or metronome going on yeah i love that i love the the metronome we use it a lot here it really kind of is a good sound and, and audio for them the other thing i would say in that would be uh, Sam said, you know, at the end of the day, you got to deliver a certain amount of energy to the ball to get the ball to travel a certain amount of distance. And you can do that one of two ways, like Sam mentioned, length of stroke or rate. Yes. Okay, I do know this, that even the, the science has taught us that no matter what that is, that the delivery rate is consistent. So I use the analogy of like driving a car. And when you're merging to get on the interstate, right, you're on the on-ramp. Some people gas it. That might be Snedeker. Like he's going quick, fast, and early. But by the time he gets to the traffic, he's got his speed and he's maintaining it. The next person might be a little slower and kind of build upon that. But at the end of the day, as the putter is coming into the ball, whatever that rate is, that rate is maintaining and it's consistent. It's not slowing down and it's not accelerating. So some people are going faster. They may be going 90 miles an hour. The next person might be going 60, but that rate is consistent to the strike of the ball. So hopefully that kind of helps do a little bit of that. All right, we've got a couple more questions. Josh, I'm gonna have you jump into this one first. We've got, do you initiate the putt with your arms or your shoulders? This is kind of, I don't know, might be a trick question for you, buddy. Okay. So I'm gonna throw it to you. What do you I think? Give me the hard one. <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you think? So I like it that our arms are pretty much connected with our upper body when we putt, right? And so when we rotate, I think the arms are pretty still and they stay connected with the, with the shoulders. I would say the shoulders kind of start more than, I'm not reaching out with my arms, right? So the more that my arms can stay connected to my torso and I can rotate, I feel like the more consistent my stroke is going to be. Like this. What, do you, what do you think? Coach, what, hey. your, this, I, what I love about, thank you for throwing yeah. that question out there, because you're going to get differences of opinions here. This is good. We're going to get a little, let's, let, what do you got? Well, what I would say, <laughs> I, I think Josh is, is right for sure. I mean, staying connected is key. I think that's the thing he said. He didn't use arms or shoulders, talked about rotating, staying connected. Um, I'm a big believer a lot of times, most amateurs are thinking, you know, instructors will tell them, hey, use your big muscles, even on full swing. And, my belief again is that you can, if you have the right setup, really again, I'm thinking not just the wrist, I'm thinking the arms. The arms are going to dictate. So if I move my arms, then my shoulders move. Hopefully there's no one out there that's calling me out on my anatomy and how the <laughs> physiology works with my body. But if I move this right arm, that's also moving my shoulder. And I think that gets us, sometimes we get too much, you know, kind of big muscle. And I, I do think it's important when we putt, we do have some feel in our wrists and our arms. Good. What are your thoughts, Tom? Good point. All right, so here's my answer to that question. Then we're going to go speed round okay. after this. We got, we got questions we've got to get through here. We're going to go speed round on that, my favorite part. So here's, I, I, I would agree 100% with what Josh said, that most amateur golfers, when they're first taught, feel like it's more shoulders. That's kind of, it's a good concept, right? I think great putters, it's really, truly a combination. 
It's a little bit of shoulders, it's a little bit of arms, it's a little bit of wrist. Some people are more in certain areas than others. Some are more wrist, or some are, but it's really the combination of the two. I don't think it's just one sole thing. And so beginners, shoulders, advanced players, I really think it's kind of a combination. So I'm gonna split the difference on you two guys there. How's that? All right, speed round. All right, here we go. We want quick answers to these. Keep those questions coming. We got a couple more minutes left. We're gonna get to as many as we can. All right, here we go. Sam, what are the best ways to practice putting at home? 30 seconds, what do you got? Two things, I would work on your aim. I would set up a penny about five feet from you. I'd see if you could roll that ball over a penny. Ooh, I like so that would be just aim. Speed control, I think again, if you have, if you think about length of motion, your cadence, get a metronome on your app, whatever, have something click in so you're working on that. That would be my two things. Boom, Josh, 30 seconds, what do you got? Um, I like putting down an object, whether it's a dollar bill or a card, a playing card, put it down on the ground go 10 feet or so away and see if you can get that ball to stop on the dollar Ooh. bill or the playing card. Ooh, that sounds like a college game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you can play with your buddies and that whoever gets it gets the dollar bill. Oh, uh, that's all that's fun. All right, okay, here's mine. I'm going to go a little different angle. I would go to the putting green with a friend, set your phone up, uh, and get a video of you making maybe like a 10 to 15 foot putt, okay? And then put that on auto replay and go home and just watch it. Watch yourself making a putt over and over and over. And that visualization of you hitting the stroke, you hitting the ball, rolling the ball, I should say, the ball going in, I think is really powerful. Can I ask you a question for yeah. speed round? Yeah. Do you think uh, uh, putters are more left hand dominant or right hand dominant? What do you think to start, Josh? Uh, I'll go, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, we do some drills with one hand putting here, and I see most people who are right handed are much better with their right hand only than their left hand. The left hand gets a little shaky, so I would say probably right hand. I love that question because my favorite golfer of all time is Seve Ballesteros. And when he would walk into putt, some of you out there, the, my old guys, they know this guy. Some of the young guys don't even know who he is. But he would, when he would come into the putt, he'd kind of hold it in his right hand and shake it like this. I do a ton of drills with my students with their dominant hand, which for me would be my right hand. I think both hands work. Uh, Tiger Woods is known to be a right hand dominant golfer. Um, Stock, Dave Stockton was a phenomenal putter. He believes the left hand. So again, yeah. I think it just really depends and it's a feel thing, but I, we do believe in doing a lot of either or hand and working on those drills. All right, good. All right, a couple more. We're going to keep, keep them cranking. We're going speed round here. My backstroke, Sam, uh, my backstroke with my putter is shorter than my follow through stroke. Will that affect my putting? I think in this certain situation it could. I, I do think that might mean that there's an inefficiency as far as, you know, that length of motion might not be the right matchup for your cadence. So I do, my, my thing again would be to fix one and see how it affects the other one. So if you think it's going too fast through, like Todd used a great example, coming onto the interstate, you're likely coming into that ball with a faster rate than you went back with it. Perfect. So in that situation. Josh, 30 seconds, what do you think? Oh, I think it could be affecting it. I'd like to see more of a, maybe a shorter follow through, but not like, I mean, pretty consistent overall. Um, it could be going, like Sam said, speeding up and going really too far. So maybe we need to slow down the cadence a little bit, and then it should be should be a little more consistent. I like it. I would say this. I, I in theory, for beginner golfers, 50-50 is a good analogy. We use that a lot. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen somebody who plays golf with their name on their bag for a living who has a short backstroke and a long follow through. Maybe there's somebody, prove me wrong if you can find them out there. I see a lot of people with their name on their bag who make a lot of money playing golf, whose backstroke is a little bit longer than their forward stroke. Not drastic, maybe 55 back, 45 through, something like that. But I think that if that putter, if the stroke is long on the follow through, you're probably accelerating through, which is one of the killers, I think, to good putting. All right, here we go, last one. Speed round, Sam. How do you know what tempo or beats per minute is best for you with the metronome? How would you tell somebody? I would, if you can, use the metronome when you're actually putting. So at the end of the day, if you're just using the metronome and you're not actually putting anything, hit some putts at different lengths. I would start on kind of a middle range putt and just see, mess around with it. Hit some putts where you're going really fast, hit some where you're actually going a little bit slower and just, just kind of experiment a little bit. See if you start making some putts and how that controls your speed. Josh? I think if you do some continuous strokes like Sam was doing with his speed drill, you just kind of, whatever you do, I believe that you're going to find your cadence, and then you can probably just match up the tempo of the metronome to that. I, like it. I would answer two ways. One is, how do you swing the golf club? If you're kind of long and slow with your stroke and your golf, and, and your natural golf swing, your probably stroke is going to be a little bit slower with your pace and your metronome. And then also, how, how do you kind of just go through life? 
Some people walk kind of slow, some talk slow, some are faster. I think there's a lot of synergy between that. I've never ridden in the car with Schwarzenegger, but he's probably, maybe he's a pretty fast driver. <laughs> right? I don't know, but my guess is there's probably, there's probably some consistencies to that. So, all right, closing thoughts. We're going to go Sam, Josh, and myself. We're going to do a quick wrap-up. Closing thoughts. We've got people stuck around. We appreciate you sticking around. What's the last thing you want to tell them about putting uh, so they can improve? Think those three skills so again if you focus on those you have 30 minutes to practice realistically whether you're 30 minutes before instead of maybe going to hit balls for 30 minutes go to the putting green start out with speed control do the drill that we talked about use your eyes more work on your aim get a drill that we talked about making sure that we do that and then with setup that stability drill that Todd has I think if you mix up those 10 minutes each Mix in a little bit of a game at the end, you're going to be ready and you're going to shoot lower scores instead of just going to the range instead of putting. Josh, last closing thoughts. Um, next time you go by a putter, make sure we're aware of how it affects the aim, whether the shape of the head, where the hosel's doing, the lines. Just be aware of it. And the more you're aware of it, the more you'll notice the differences. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. I, okay, so here's my closing thoughts. Be, be aware of your narrative. You want to be a great putter, tell you, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. Right, that's worked pretty well for us three. Right, sometimes you gotta fake it till you make it. Just tell yourself you're a great putter. When you're gonna practice, maybe 10 minutes of technical, 20 minutes of just putting around and doing those types of stuff. Make sure and have some fun when you're doing it. And last but not least, find what works best for you. Putting is individual. There's thousands of styles, thousands of ways to do it. Find what works best for you. You don't have to conform to the status quo. If something works for you, go ahead and do it and use it. Now, all right, so tomorrow we're going two o'clock. 2 o'clock Central Time, we're talking about course management. Sam, give us a brief description of what are we going to talk about tomorrow when they tune in? We're going to give you three on-course strategies. So these are things that if you apply tomorrow and you were to go out and play, you're going to shoot lower scores. You're going to learn about how to hit the fat side of the green. You're going to learn how to know your dispersion pattern with your tee shot. You're also going to learn about eleva elevation gain or loss and how to analyze that and put that into your strategy. I like it. I'm really looking forward to it. We appreciate you for coming out, spending some time with us. We hope on behalf of the Sanford Power Golf Academy, on behalf of U.S. Golf TV, that these are some times you can come and talk about golf. Get away from all the serious stuff that's really happening in the world and talk about something we all love and have a passion for. Take care of yourself. Listen to what the healthcare providers are suggesting. Uh, be safe because the golf season is coming. I promise you it's coming, and we're going to be ready. We're going to do everything we can to help you have a great season. We will hopefully see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock.